On June 29th, the Transition Accelerator team is hosting a webinar, Deep Geothermal Superpower, Canada's Potential for a Breakthrough in Enhanced Geothermal Systems. So I'm going to talk to Dr. Th Thomas Homer Dixon. He's an adjunct professor with the School of Environment and Sustainability and the founder and director of the Cascade Institute at Royal Roads University and also one of the webinar presenters. So welcome to the interview, Thomas. I'm delighted to be with you today. Well, look, I have done many interviews with uh, folks who are in the geothermal industry. I have never heard anybody talk about deep geothermal. Maybe we could start there. What is that? This is deep geothermal power where you go uh, 10, even 15 kilometers under the surface of the earth. So you're going very deep as opposed to standard hydrothermal geothermal, where you tap into existing water bearing strata or rock that uh, may be three or so kilometers deep, uh, still well underground, but nowhere near as deep. Uh, in this case, we'd be going much deeper, which would open up the possibility of drilling for heat this way. Uh, outside tectonically active zones, outside areas where the heat is fairly close to the surface, which is what generally where we drill for geothermal heat now. Uh, and, uh, and one of the problems with drilling in tectonically active zones and pumping a lot of fluid into these into this rock is that you can induce earthquakes. It's called the induced seismicity problem. But if you can go deeper uh, through hot, hard rock into hot, dry rock at 10 plus kilometers, you have the opportunity to get away from those tectonically active zones to reduce the challenge of induced seismicity. And also you have the opportunity to get, uh, get into really hot rock. So much more heat gain and much more capacity to uh, generate electricity on the surface of the planet. Um, help me understand this. Are we talking about uh, fracking rock uh, to, to get at the, the hot water? Perhaps, I mean, that's one of the, uh, the options available. There are a couple of possibilities. So the trick is you have to be able to drill through rock that's very hard, much harder than standard sedimentary rock. So this would be uh, uh, metamorphic rock like schist or igneous rock like granite, uh, 10 to 100 times harder than the rock that we drill, that, that the standard drill bits are capable of drilling through that you use for, say, oil and gas wells. Uh, the the well-known three-cone uh, toothed drill bits that operate by rotation and grinding. So uh, those kinds of drill bits simply don't work in such, in, in such uh, hard rock. Uh, we need new kinds of technologies, which is an issue that we address in our, in our recent study of this technology. Um, then if you can get really deep, you, you have a, an input well for input fluid and an output well, uh, and you have to connect the two wells together. You could, uh, and the standard technology would be to frack the rock between the two wells. Now you're very, very deep at this point. So you're not in water bearing strata. You're not interfering with uh, uh, the water table in any way. Um, it's dry rock. So you're not bringing any fluid up from, from uh, those depths. Uh, you frack the rock and then you run the fluid down the input well and up the output well uh, at very high temperatures, hopefully over 300 degrees Celsius. But the other possibility is that you simply connect the two wells together with a straight pipe, uh, a lined pipe of some kind, and, uh, and that way it's an entirely closed system, which is, uh, the rock may be hot enough to do that if you can get deep enough. Is this what we call closed loop geothermal, where essentially you're circulating, so you've got the, the two, uh, you've got the two wells and you're, they're, they're joined at the bottom, yes. and you're circulating uh, fluid through, which then are heated up uh, uh, by the, uh, well, the heat down at, you know, 15 kilometers down into the ground. Is that what we're talking about? Yes. So the challenge with, if the rock is fracked, then the fluid that you're circulating is coming into contact with the raw rock. And you're bringing potentially contaminants up to the surface that have to be taken out of the fluid before it's recycled back down. If you, if you have a closed loop system where the, the pipe uh, that's joining the input and the output well is sealed, then you don't have any contamination problem. The challenge is, that is, is whether you have sufficient contact with the hot rock, rock to extract the, enough heat to actually make the whole thing worthwhile. Um, we argue that if you can get deep enough, then you're probably in rock that's hot enough that you can, you can uh, uh, more viably create a closed loop system with the benefits that come with that. 
No, I uh, just yesterday I interviewed the CEO of uh, Everloop Technologies, and it sounds like this is kind of like that. Uh, and he made the point that the efficiency of their system works really well for heat transfer using heat pumps, I believe, uh, but not for electricity generation. But I heard you earlier in, in this interview talk about generating electricity with this deep geothermal. Um, could you explain that? Well, uh, this is where we get into physics. And I, at some point, I'd have to defer to the experts who, who uh, were involved in writing this paper. But uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, if you get deep enough, you can get sufficient heat gain, you get sufficient differential in the temperature between the surface of the earth and the heat in, in deep in the earth that you can, you should be able to generate enormous amounts of power. So here's the key thing. I, I think this technology is only really interesting if you're using it to generate large amounts of zero carbon electricity. We're going to be electrifying our economies. Sure, we can do a lot of stuff with, with just heat. There are many places where we can use heat directly. But uh, what we need more than anything else is huge amounts of zero carbon electricity. And we argue in our paper that as compared to photovoltaic, solar and wind power, uh, the power density of ultra deep geothermal could be uh, much higher, orders of magnitude higher. So that basically means that you're able to generate more electricity per square meter of the surface of the earth that you're occupying with your plant. At the moment of the power density and it, this is a fundamental problem with both PV, solar, and wind. The power density is low. It's in the order of watts per square meter of surface area occupied. We, could, we, we believe with ultra deep geothermal, you can get the power density uh, up into the tens of watts per square meter, which changes, changes the geographic impact enormously of this technology. It means that you have to use a lot less of your surface to generate the zero carbon electricity you need. Any idea yet, and it sounds like this is still uh, theoretical, but any idea what, at what uh, cost that electricity might be generated at, say, in megawatt, uh, you know, price per megawatt hour? Well, the, the, uh, the key thing is to get the cost of the wells down. So, so uh, I'm not going to start quoting uh, the cost per megawatt hour because I think it's highly speculative, but I can give you some figures that we address that we raise in the paper. Um, uh, most geothermal operations now, hydro geothermal operations that are profitable, and some of them are very profitable, uh, require that the wells be drilled somewhere around five million, five to ten million dollars a well. Um, currently, to, to to drill a well. Uh, that to 10 kilometers plus through hard rock with existing technology would cost you $100 million. So there's an enormous cost gap there. We argue that the, we need to bring that cost down under 10 million, ideally to $5 million a well. So we need to reduce we need to reduce the cost by something like 90%. We've seen this kind of technological breakthrough in cost with other technologies in the IT sector, even in fracking, we've seen enormous reductions in, in uh, drilling costs and the cost of, of uh, producing wells and of fracking itself. So, um, but we're not gonna do that with standard rotary bit technology. We need, we need to use different kinds of technologies and there are at least four out there that we believe could get that, get that cost advantage, could bring the cost down to 90% that we need. Once we can start to drill wells in hard rock at 10 kilometers depth for five to $10 million a piece, and the economics of the entire technology changes, you're, you're starting to produce power that's competitive with any other power out there. Now, economist Jason Dion talks about safe bet technologies versus wildcard technologies. And so the safe bet technology is, well, like wind and solar. I mean, yes. it, may be, it may be intermittent, but it's already lowest cost way to generate electricity. Um, uh, wildcard technologies are those that, that show plenty of promise and we should continue investing in them, but they might not be you know, viable and competitive until say the 2030s or 2040s. But So this sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, Thomas, this sounds to me like a wildcard technology where governments uh, should step up and fund the research because the benefits maybe in 10 or 15 years could be enormous. That's exactly right. And we argue that in the paper. So uh, we're rolling out uh, PV solar and wind at enormous capacity. We're starting to invest in small mo modular nuclear reactors. 
uh, to try to uh, fill this anticipated zero carbon electricity gap that we're we're going to confront as we shift our economy, especially the transportation sector, towards electricity. So uh, our argument principally is that uh, we probably can't do what we need to do with just those technologies, especially solar and wind. Uh, if, and and if we try, we're going to have enormous impacts on the landscape. So. Uh, this is a technology, ultra deep geothermal, that other people are going to develop. We argue that Canada should be at the forefront. It has the initial expertise, the basic skill set that would be required to become a world leader in this area. It's going to happen uh, because it needs to happen. And the the technological challenges are reasonably, we believe, reasonably tractable. Uh, these are fundamentally just engineering challenges, not fundamental problems of physics, for example. Um, but nonetheless, as you pointed out, there's this initial investment challenge because there's no immediate benefit for the private sector to invest in this technology because the payoffs are further down the road. So there needs to be some kind of backstop government support providing uh, providing uh, streams of, of profit and revenue for private sector companies that are involved in doing the experimentation to get us up that learning curve so that we can do this more cheaply. So it has to, the government has to be involved uh, in the same way that it has been, for instance, in the development of nuclear power in Canada, uh, really quite successfully in the past. Uh, final question, Thomas. Uh, okay, where are we at with this technology? Uh, has it been, has there been research done? Has there been some development of, of the, these four technologies that you talk about? And, and where is the discussion with this in, term, in terms of development with the Canadian government, with provincial governments? Uh, are we at the very early stages? Are we midway? Where are we? I'll ask, answer your last question first. Uh, there is very little discussion. I mean, the governments really aren't paying much attention to this at all. And to the extent they are, for instance, in BC, it's all about hydro geothermal. It's not about making these, the drilling technology breakthrough. We, we argue that the drilling technology is really a sine qua non. It's a necessary condition uh, in making this breakthrough. Nothing else works without it. Uh, now, there are substantial developments. Uh, there's a company in Jersey in the UK called Strata, a Strata Corporation, which specializes in percussive drilling. Um, they've, uh, they say they've achieved a remarkable rate of about uh, 20 meters per hour through igneous rock, which is extraordinary. I mean, that would be fast even for sedimentary drilling. Um, there's a company in Croatia that's specializing in plasma drilling. There's another company that's just been capitalized uh, with venture seed funding of $40 million out of MIT called Quays that's focusing on microwave technology. There's also a possibility of something called water jet technology. Um, at the Cascade Institute, we're in the process of digging down into the details in each of these four possibilities to, to learn about uh, which seems to be most promising and frankly, who owns the IP and where the opportunities for Canada would be in each of the, along each of these pathways. I have no doubt that this challenge will be surmounted in the future by uh, along one of these pathways or another. It's just really a question of whether Canada is going to be part of that story. Thomas, thank you very much for this. And for viewers who have uh, stuck with us this far, uh, I'll be including the link to the webinar in the YouTube uh, description. Uh, so if you're interested, you can click on it. Thank you very much for this. Thank you.